So Jean was teasing me earlier that I'd never met a microphone that I didn't like, and that's something that we share mutually. Uh, and I rarely read, but because your bio is so impressive, I want to do justice to it. And, and we are honored to have you here. Dr. Jean Clinton is a clinical professor, Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neurosciences at McMaster. She is on staff at uh, Mac Children's Hospital with cross appointments in pediat pediatrics and family medicine and an associate in the Department of Child Psychiatry, University of Toronto, and Sick Kids. She's also a senior scientist at the Infant Child Health Lab at McMaster University. She's also a fellow of the Child Trauma Academy. She's been a consultant to children and youth mental programs, child welfare, and primary care for almost 30 years. And Dr. Clinton was recently appointed as an education advisor to the Premier of Ontario and the Minister of Education. Um, for those of you who have had a chance to work with Jean, as I have over the years, uh, what you'll also know is that she is a passionate mm -hmm. champion for kids uh, and a great collaborator. She's somebody that listens well, uh, that has developed an international reputation both as a speaker and a researcher and a leader, uh, but she's never forgotten that this is her home, this is where she started, and this is where she continues to be passionately involved. Um, I have a particular vested interest tonight, though, and yes. you have five kids that are now grown, and we've often talked about that over the course of the years, but mine are now 14, 13, and 10. So the notion of what's happening in the adolescent mind in this development is of particular interest in the journey that we are on. And there are days that are amazing, and there are others in which they're even better. Yeah. Please join me in providing a warm welcome to Dr. Jean. family in the audience, you sometimes temper your comments, so uh, Terry's lovely daughter, uh, Lane Tamara, is here, and my brother, my little brother, is also uh, in the audience here with his lovely, uh, my lovely sister-in-law. So I'm, I'm really thrilled to be here, and you know, it's really lovely to be introduced by someone that you've known for many, many years, and to have a lovely reminder of your Hamilton roots. Um, I have been in Hamilton for 50 plus years, which doesn't mean I'm from here yet, apparently, even though I've been here 50 years. My dad, uh, another thing Terry and I share, is um, our, uh, uh, my dad uh, was an educator in 1965. There, were a, there was a shortage of teachers, and so uh, my dad was interviewed in Scotland, and um, he came to Hamilton to the Catholic board and started as a teacher, became a principal and a superintendent, went to the dark side when he became a superintendent. So education, education is interesting that uh, as children of educators, how passionate uh, uh, Terry and I are about education uh, and, uh, and children's well-being. So the title tonight is Driving Positive Change. Uh, the adolescent brain under construction. So you might think, well, the adolescent brain, first of all, people wonder what is going on in the adolescent brain. Uh, is there such a thing as the adolescent brain or does it suddenly kind of disappear for several years? Uh, and the truth, the reality is, I'm here uh, really, and listening to Matt, I'm, I'm here really to reinforce that I'm very, very strongly and emphatically how important the work of Abacus is. Because what we know is that the adolescent brain is under construction. It's not uh, children at this age period are not many adults, even though they may look like adults. Their brain is still changing dramatically. And you know, as we think about as we think about um, uh, Code Red, as we think about the social determinants of health and think about the work that my mentor, the late Dan Offer did, we realize that even if you don't get off to the best start in life for whatever reason, poverty, um, uh, mental health, illness, significant in your, um, in your parents, there are opportunities in life when the world can change again. And what we know is that the middle years, the, the grade six, seven, eight, and adolescence is another period of time when we can make the race fair for kids, 
even if they didn't get off to the best start. The changes that we now know are happening in the adolescent brain are amazing. But what we have to, first of all, get our heads around is that what we think affects how we feel, affects how we act. And so my mentor, the late Dr. Dan Offord, he saw that if you were born in poverty, then your life chances were different. And I often talk when I do my presentations, I talk about that 21 year life difference between where my brother teaches at St. Bridget's School or inner city Hamilton and where we live up on the lovely West Mountain. How is that that we have a fair and equal society if 21 years of difference in life expectancy, you know that's what we call a hard output, you know that outcome there, death, you know, you, you don't kind of quibble with that for the most part. So, Dan dedicated his life to saying, how can we make it equal? How can we create a, a playing field that is much more level for kids, no matter where they're growing, living, loving, and thriving? And so what I love about Abacus, and I was reading beforehand, is it's taking children, young people, who are at huge risk of not doing well because of conditions that have nothing to do with them themselves. It's, uh, it's, it's not their fault that they may be living in conditions where they don't have the kind of support that the children in Westdale uh, and West Mountain have. So we need to think about what is our role? So what we think affects how we feel, affects how we act. So if we think, wow, adolescence is a time when the creativity, the magnificence of the unique way of thinking of the adolescent brain, the passion of adolescence, the ability to make connections that are not limited by our adult limitations, we need to have a rewiring of our brains about what adolescence is about. And I'm going to talk to you tonight both about the hard side of some of that wonder, but also I want to fill you with some of the excitement and why Abacus is such an amazing opportunity uh, for children. I also want to be um, uh, to share with you that I want to be thinking along with the Hamilton Community Foundation and the boards about how can this move from a 40 kids up to systemically being part of what happens for all for all children. I think that's when we start saying it takes a community. It takes a community to raise the child. But let's get down to the matter that brought you all here this evening. And that is the question of why do adolescents, why do they do the things they do? So here you see somebody, I wonder as an adult, what happens to the frickin' bike? Right? But as I ask many adults, who wants to do this? Okay, in this room, who wants to do this? Very few adults. Of course, they're always male. The, hands go up. the male brain is different than the female brain. I'm going to tell you about that. But what's different about adolescence? Does he know that this is dangerous? Does he know? Yes, absolutely. Does he know that it's risky? Yes. Does he know that death is one of the optional outcomes? Yes. So why does he do it? It's not going to happen to him, so a belief that I'm exempt from that. But how has he done that? What has he said? What's more important? The thrill, baby. It is all about the thrill. And so the adolescent brain, we now know biologically, is more wired to seek thrills. I'm going to show you some of the ways that we've come to discover this and introduce a concept called neuroplasticity. So that the brain is plastic, changeable by experience. And how we know this is through scans. We used to, uh, I particularly wanted to donate my son's brain for science to try and figure out what the heck he was up to. But now 
Now we can find out more about the brain and in the past decade, 15 years, we've learned so much more about what happens and the changes that happen in the adolescent brain. So we used to think what we thought was it was hormones. So what we felt was, oh my gosh, we'll just have to get through this. So how we acted was we talked to our friends about how some alien invaded the room at 14 and uh, sort of late, four years later, out comes a different adult. So, but what we now know is what we think is that it's the brain that's changing significantly in childhood at this period of time. We knew the early years were really important. I'll talk a little bit about them, that the, 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 the number of pathways that get built in the early years really set very strong architecture and foundation. But what we didn't know was just how much brain changing and sculpting happens in the adolescent brain. So here's a key message. We as parents make a huge difference. We have seen an explosion in uh, negative stories about young people. We've given, we're given the impression as parents that we don't count anymore, it's all about the peers. While the research is showing us very, very clearly that that's not the case. That the, we know, and the um, uh, American Medical Association talks about, uh, parent connectedness is the single healthiest force in the lives of US teenagers. Parent connectedness. And then just as I was waiting, um, I get a colleague uh, sends me a tweet that says there is an, um, uh, an assessment done which is very, very important. It's called the PISA, which is an international student achievement program that looks at 540,000 children across 72 countries. And what has just been released today is teenagers who feel part of a school community and enjoy good relations with their parents and teachers are more likely to perform better academically and be happier with their lives according to the first OECD PISA assessment of students' well-being. So what we have is the need for us to have a counter-revolution you get the kind of sense of this? We need to be thinking not about what the popular press might tell us, but we need to be thinking about what I see is at the heart of the abacus intervention. And you know, as Matt was talking about, providing academic support, mentoring, goal setting, and providing incentives for kids, me with my shrinky brain, saw so something that goes throughout all of them. Throughout all of them is the quality of relationships and the opportunity to be creating relationships in education to rewire the brains of the young people who are involved in the program. Does that make sense? Okay, so let's go deeper into what do I mean? So, Know that I have a very firm belief in 30 years of experience that says parents make a huge difference in the lives of kids. That positive parenting and relationships are essential for kids to do well. Relationships are the nutrition of the brain. You could have somebody going in doing mentoring goal setting, incentives, and academic support. And if they don't like kids, there's no frickin' way a single thing is gonna happen. Now, just to let you know, frickin' comes from a story. It's not really swearing, all right? It's not swearing. So, this is all about the brain. It's all about the brain. I am a brain geek. I love the brain. Um, as you heard, I have lots of experience with the adolescent brain. I have five kids who are now 22 to 32 who I refuse to call my adult children, partly because they don't consider themselves adult yet, uh, especially now that we have some emerging adulthoods. On adults, which means that they're finished a degree and they're back living in the basement, you know? So, I am a brain geek. 
So I love the brain because what we have learned in the past 10, 15 years, and this is news to you if, you, if, you, if you're interested in this area, and that is that we are our brain. It is our master organ. But our brain is sculpted by experience. We used to think genes played a much bigger role in making us who we are. That the genetic, we got uh, genes from our mom and our dad, um, the uh, genes for IQ, you got if your mom and dad were smart, you were smart, and then uh, the more kids you had, the dumber they got. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> only kidding, especially since my youngest brother is in the room. He's smarter than I am. So. But, so what we used to think, though, was that your genes determined so, so much about the person that you became. And what we now know is it's not your genes, but how your genes get turned on or silenced by the environment, by the experience that you have. So my first degree, I'm one of these weird McMaster graduates, medical school. So my first degree is, um, what is it, is music. Music and philosophy. So we used to go to uh, the bar, the pub at McMaster. Some of you will fondly remember the Phoenix, yes. And the downstairs John, sometimes if we were lowering ourselves to the downstairs John. But we would have these arguments. Is it nature or is it nurture? What makes the biggest difference? Is it genes or is it the environment? And so it was a great time, but I joke and say it was a waste of time. Because what we now know is that the genes are turned on or silenced and they interact with the environment. And that there are different periods in life when that gene-environment interaction is more robust. So in the early years in pregnancy and the first couple of years of life, lots and lots of brain building, brain sculpting by how much you get talked to and sung to and soothed. Another huge one we now know happens in the adolescent brain. So the opportunity to really make a difference in the lives of children is based now on the concept that relationships and connections matter. And I like the, I like the connections word because by that I mean connection through communication by also hugely mean neurons, <coughs> neurons connecting with each other. So our brains are composed of billions and trillions of brain cells called neurons. They go in utero to the geography that I'll show you, the geography of the different areas of the brain that function for sight, for sound, for thinking, problem solving. They go into those general areas, but they don't get hooked up, as it were. They don't get connections without the experience. So babies are born when their brains are still under construction as well. A baby's brain only weighs about one pound. Why is that? They're in fact born prematurely, brain development-wise. Well, it's because if you imagine the brain of a baby and the brain of a toddler, and you think about which you would like to deliver, the one pound or the three pounds, it makes a lot of sense. So if our brains are constructed, first of all being in place and then literally constructed by how much language we hear, by how much soothing we get, by how much anger we're exposed to, by how much neglect we experience. You see, this is neuroplasticity, and you see that the baby doesn't say, this is a good experience, I'll keep it. This is a bad experience, I'll push it away. Just like our middle school kids don't question why don't I feel like I belong here? They don't say, you have to make me feel like I belong here. That's what school should be about. They don't recognize negative experiences until they experience the positive. And then they can know, wow, this is what school can be about. So I would love if there was money in the budget 
to be able to look at the neuroplasticity of these students involved in abacus. I would love to see, are there areas of their brain like this that are changed by that experience? So just some basic brain anatomy here. We've got different regions of the brain that are responsible for different functions. And a key message for tonight is that the last area to develop is that blue part of the brain, the frontal lobes. The frontal lobes are the last to develop and the first to go in Alzheimer's. The last to develop, and what's involved in the frontal lobes, and I'm going to talk more deeply about this, but it's planning, organizing, impulse inhibition, emotional control, sounding like a list that any parent of an adolescent would say, my goodness, there are challenges here. So the last area to develop is the first to go in Alzheimer's, as I said. So there are different names to different lobes. I'm going to be talking more about the frontal lobe, and I'll also be talking more deeply within the brain about some of the other areas. So I can't, I'm not sure if you can see all of these uh, various pictures. So the parietal lobe is involved in touch. We know huge importance of touch for development. The occipital lobe is involved um, in, um, uh, in uh, vision. So one of the ways, in fact, that the whole world began to understand more about neuroplasticity was when their babies were born that had congenital cataracts. So they had a, uh, they had a problem, a kind of fuzziness over their, um, over their legs. And so what they knew at that point in time was that um, a sight came online. We thought of the brain as like a machine. And the machine had certain functions. It was able to do at certain times, depending on the genetic code. And that if it broke, you really couldn't rewire or fix it. So when they were looking at babies who had this congenital cataract, they didn't know when should we operate. And so they, what they did was, you have to plug your ears if you like cats here. So what they did was they took little kittens and they sewed shut one eye when they were very, very little. And then after a period of time, they took the stitches out. And what they found was that even though the eye worked perfectly well, so the eye at the front of the brain and the back of the brain, the occipital lobe there, the green part, even though both of them worked, the kittens couldn't see properly. And that was one of the major AHA Nobel Prize winning when they realized that you need the experience coming into the eye at the right time to build the connection, the long reach of those neurons to be reaching out, connecting to each other, and the more that they get reaching out and connecting and building the pathways, the stronger and the faster the signal. So they went, wow. Now we know that it takes certain activities to build the different parts of the brain. It needs to have, the brain needs to be exposed to certain experiences. So I'm going to tell you some of the periods of time that are crucial in development is adolescence. When kids need to be exposed to their peers without adults around. Did you hear that part? Exposed to their peers without adults around so that they can learn the skills of negotiating relationships and connections. The new brain science tells us very, very clearly that the environment matters. The environment matters massively. At this, I usually talk about um, a book that I really loved reading called The Brain That Changes Itself by Norman Doidge. It's a fantastic book. Uh, but just before we had um, uh, we had a, a, a get together for dinner, a lovely a lovely dinner, uh, and I was by horror 
in my talks is always that there's a freaking neuroscientist in the audience. <laughs> and wasn't there a famous neuroscientist? Dr. Sandra Whittleson was at dinner. And so she's, the, you know, Dr. Sandra Whittleson, the one who has Einstein's brain at McMaster. So she was at dinner, right? And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, she's going to come to this talk, and what am I going to be, what am I going to say? But we were talking a little bit about the brain that changes itself. And one of her worries as a bench neuroscientist is that we create too much hope in books with rare events. So the brain that changes itself talks about some magnificent stories about people whose brains get altered because of neuroplasticity. But as a bench researcher, she, as in a, in a, a, a world-class researcher, she has to look at it through the lens of science to say, well, how often does that happen? Is it easy for it to happen? What's the evidence of what happens underneath it? So whatever I say now about neuroscience, it always has to be tempered by, well, this is what we think we know. Because we don't have, we don't have a direct connection between child behavior X and this is exactly what's happening in the brain. Right, does that make sense? But having said that, I love the book, The Brain That Changes Itself. And I love it because of the hope. And here's a story that I want to implant in your brain. He talks about a man who has a major stroke. So this man in his 60s has a major stroke. He goes to rehab and then he goes, he's sent home. They've done all that they can. But his children, one of whom is a neuroscientist, says, you know, this isn't the end, this isn't Papa. And so what they do is from a brain science perspective says, you know, you first learn basic functions and then more complicated functions. So you first learn how to crawl and then you learn how to walk. So what they did with their father is they did exactly that. He would crawl around the garden and then eventually he could walk and uh, on, uh, leaning against the wall and then finally, he actually got back to teaching at a university. When he died, they did an autopsy to see, well, you know, maybe his brain cells didn't die. Maybe, maybe there was just kind of stunned tissue around that lasted a long time. But what they actually saw was he had a hole in his brain. The, the tissues had actually died. So what made the difference there? What made the difference there I see is something that is a theme in my, in my presentation tonight. And that is the hope that one, it was the relationship that that man had with his sons who believed in him and saw what was not yet visible. They saw he is a neuroscientist. In his brain, he saw the possibility of his dad being able to rewire around the deficit, the whole of the stroke. He saw it, and so he could believe it. So, if you told me that story in 1981 when I graduated from medical school, I would have said that's major, major sci, major uh, sci-fi. You know, Isaac Asimov might have written that story. But in fact. Here's the thing, you know that old, yeah, well, I'll believe it when I see it, put it on its head. Not, I'll believe it when I see it, but I see it when I believe that it's possible. I think Abacus is an example of a program that says, I will see the opportunities and the wonder and the capability of children I'll see it when I believe that it's there. And so I think we need to be thinking about that for all of our work as parents, as grandparents, with our young people. So, I'll see it when I believe it. Now, did Socrates see it? Did he believe it? This is what he talked about. He said, our youth now love luxury 
They have bad manners, contempt for authority, show disrespect for their elders, and love chatter in place of exercise. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so this guy was like 399 BC, right? So that is, we're in 2017, you have to add more to it. So it means that there's always been this period of time. There's always been this period of time between childhood and taking on adult roles. It also means there's always been grumpy old farts that would make negative comments. But you know, so um, Aristotle talked about it, Shakespeare talked about it. The line that I love here is would any but these boiled brains of 19 and 2 and 20 hunt in this weather? <laughs> so what I love about that is where would we be as a human species if we did not have adolescents going out and hunting and this the, the, in their boiled or otherwise brain? Where would we be as a species? So there is a biological change that happens, but there is one that we need to be thinking about very differently. So, key message, the teen brain, the brain is under construction. Not a mini adult, not an adult in waiting. And that what we think about this brain affects how we interact with our kids. Because this is cognitive behavior therapy kind of stuff. But what we think affects how we feel, affects how we act. So if we think these are going to be horrible years, then we feel, oh my gosh, it's happening, look what he's doing, he's always over there, oh I'm getting the look, that's it, I'm not going to have my relationship with my lovely one for four more years or six more years. How we feel incredibly affects how we act. And so I really want us to be able to see that if we can have a bit of a scientific perspective on what's going on in the brain, it's not necessarily going to make it simple for us to parent, but it will help us. Now I was going to um, uh, change this uh, picture here for one of my own son um, skydiving which he sent me after he was finished skydiving, <laughs> but he wouldn't tell me beforehand. So, three key points about brain maturation to keep in mind, and this is the work of Dr. Larry Steinberg. The brain in adolescence, the work of the brain is to become more specialized. So if you can imagine in the early years, the brain is constructed by experience, and then there's tons and tons of learning. And the, when, the brain to, when the brain cells talk to each other, it forms synapses. So they don't actually touch the neurons, but they send out these uh, uh, tree-like branches. And the more an experience happens, the more those branches get connected up and connect with other ones. So the middle years of childhood, so from 6 to 12, huge, huge changes happening, really important changes happening in the brain. That's when, uh, when kids are learning tons and tons and tons of things. Then in adolescence, what starts to happen is pruning. So what an adolescent is busy doing and focusing on, like academic support, having the other things in place that we heard about, mentoring, goal setting, and saying, if that's what you're focusing on, then they're the skills, they're the neuronal pathways that are being built. If you're in the basement playing Grand Theft Auto or other video games, that's what's building your brain. Your brain develops in response to your environment around you. Your brain responds to the environment around you. And so the creation of learning environments where kids are building a new sense of themselves, a new identity, I am a learner, that to me translates into specialized gray matter for those kids 
more connected white matter. The, the white matter is when you've got, um, you've got a major highway being constructed and then you myelinate it, you, you um, uh, like it's put like putting copper wiring on it, you insulate it so that boom, you move faster. So not only are you building connections in adolescence, you're pruning away what you don't use but your connections are becoming faster. And here's the other thing. As your connections are becoming faster as they talk to each other, they also get faster in terms of starting the impulse in the first place. So you see, we talk in education about scaffolding, about building on prior learning. Well, that's so that your neurons, I've heard about it before, can go, hey man, I know this. And then as you repeat it and connect it, well, I can tell you, Abacus will be a program that is focusing on how do we create the knowledge and the learning that is significant and relevant to this young person's life. It's going to be individualized. Am I right? I'm right. It's going to be individualized to be meaningful. It's the only way that it makes any sense. It's the only way that it makes any sense. So, one, we've got the gray matter and the white matter. You've got, you can picture this myelin getting, you know, myelinating and getting these, uh, uh, these robust areas going. So, if a child, if a young person is involved in a school system, that says, like, I visited, um, I visited a school, um, a, a Hamilton uh, Weber school, a high school recently, and I walked into this classroom. First of all, I met with a group of four students, and they were talking to me about their global uh, connections course, and they were saying about how incredibly powerful it is to have a sense of purpose in their education to have a sense of meaning and hope in what they do. I then walked into a business leadership course and the kids were talking about how am I going to teach the rest of the people, how are we going to cover these 16 different rules of leadership excellence. And so they were in groups, learning together, learning about collaboration, about communication, about different perspectives, about problem solving, because they're not all the same. And the one group was creating a rap song, a rap song that was going to communicate to the other learners about what these four rules were. Now, can you imagine that classroom compared to a classroom where you're sitting, you've got the guy up at front, he's writing on the board, here are the 17 rules of leadership of what the heck the guy's name anyway, Harrison or who, who knows. These guys, incredible excitement about learning. I'd love to take pictures of those kids' brains and see what part is lighting up. What part is lighting up? Is the part lighting up, I hate this effing place? There is actually a part of the brain that I like. Okay, but here's number two. Point number two is that there is a changing balance between, remember I told you about the frontal lobes, the executive director? So that is the last to develop, but the rest of the brain is still under construction, it's developing. So the emotional part of the brain, the emotional part of the brain, the thrill-seeking part of the brain, is developing ahead of the oops part of the brain. Stop and think about it now. That develops later. So some people say it's like the brain of an adolescent is like having a Ferrari driver who doesn't know where the brakes are yet. We get that picture? Okay, so the issue of when is this going on and what does it mean when the brain is going on? Larry Steinberg and others talk about if you've got this amazing plasticity going on, it also means you're more vulnerable for damage. So I'll touch on it here, but talk about that uh, on later on as well. So as the brain is changing, and you can imagine it molding, sculpting with, um, uh, with the different experiences that come in, as it's changing, 
is more vulnerable to be damaged by drugs. So kids, when they drink early in, in, in uh, their teen years, it changes their brains, which are still under construction, in a very different way than the impact of the same amount of alcohol on the fixed adult brain. So alcohol has a different impact on young people's brains than it does on adults' brains. Drugs have more of an impact, a different impact, not the same. So you know, people who as adults smoke a lot of dope, or whatever they smoke, uh, weed, and think that it's all right for their kids to do it, have to understand it doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. The adolescent brain is much more vulnerable. So, you know, when does this adolescence finish? So what we now know is that it keeps going on until about 25 years of age. Later in guys, sometimes, <laughs> a lot later, sometimes, as I've heard. But here's the thing. So here we've got this biological kind of a mismatch, and this is uh, described by an evolutionary biologist, that in adolescence, in, uh, there is a wide period of time between when you're biologically ready to take on adulthood, such as having a family, so your biological readiness for that between childhood and that age is only about four or five years. It's the way of the world in some of the projects I'm involved with in Kenya, where the girls have become pregnant at 13 and 14 in the hunter-gatherer societies. So that's part of why we are trying to support them in continuing on in school. But biologically, there is a short period, a short window between childhood and adulthood. But psychologically and sociologically, we have created a massive gap. So kids have their first period, girls have their first period around 10 or 11, first baby, age 29. Biologically, four years. Sociologically, 18, 19 years. It's such a point now that there's a new, a new phase of life called emerging adulthood. It is now being written about, not only written about, but Ontario's um, uh, mental health strategy is including specific strategies for emerging adulthood. So it does not finish at 18, but we now talk about it going on until 25 years of age. And you read this and you wonder, well, why is it? Well, a huge part of this has to do with the, autom uh, the automation of an industry. That the kids and the opportunities for work later are less. The skills that kids mm -hmm. need to be survivals, to, to survive in the upcoming economy are very different than the skills that, are, that were uh, perhaps what we needed um, in our 60s now. It's a complicated issue, but the reality for me as a child psychiatrist is when I see parents who have their children back in the frickin' basement, they're worried, Am I, have I done something wrong? The reality is this is a new stage. Are the kids doing something wrong? The reality is this is a societal change in difference. So the world has changed. The world has changed. I have a group of colleagues who are very worried that part of this emerging, this holding on to childhood and not going into adulthood also has to do with how we have been overprotective of kids. That we have made them too safe for their own good, as it were. We've bubble wrapped them. You know, we're going in now in high school and helping them make their selections. Uh, my, my good friend who's a, a psychologist told me about one time a parent calling her up and saying, you know, if my daughter gets two more marks on your course in, um, in university psychology, then she'll have a good enough GPA to a grade point average to get into medical school, right? The mother was calling the professor up. The professor said, if your daughter 
leaves her mama to call up to get more marks. I don't want her for my doctor hung up, right? So how has the world changed? So here's an example. When Terry and I were kids, when you played musical chairs, you took away a chair. Now I want you to think about it. Nowadays, oh my gosh, self-esteem is everything. You know, you get a trophy for just turning up. You know, the, uh, uh, the, 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 the student who breathes in and out all day long gets a sticker. So, a serious issue that we have to really truly be wondering about. We have to be wondering about. So, what is happening then deep inside the brain? And I'm going to tell you that these societal changes are also changing the brain. Because, you know, whenever I do this talk on the adolescent brain, people wonder, well, you know, Alexander the Great was about 15 or 16. Romeo and Juliet, well, maybe they're not the best example, but they're only about 14. Um, uh, Marie Antoinette. One family physician came up to me after a talk at the Humble Academy of Medicine and said that when he was 16, he went to join the Merchant Navy and he was a captain shortly thereafter. Can we imagine our 16-year-olds going off and joining the Merchant Navy? We don't let them go to frickin' beggars anymore without us checking in with them. So, the question is, the question is, how is our overprotectiveness contributing to the high anxiety that we are now seeing in our teens? Is it contributing? Is it part of the contributing? So what we know is the brain is changing. This is the work of Jay Geet that shows that this brain is literally blue, is when it is getting uh, more mature that it changes from the back to the front and from the inside outside. So from deeper functions like emotions to the outside. Now here is a definitive slide that shows us that yes, in fact, the male brain is bigger than the female brain. There are differences between the male brain and the female brain. But everyone knows that bigger is not necessarily better. It also shows us, verified by uh, our esteemed neuroscientist, Dr. Whittleson, who had to go to a lab meeting, uh, that the girl's brain develops ahead of the boy's brain. So we see girls maturing earlier than boys. We also know that the brain is our largest sex organ. It is so attunedly, so finely attuned to the variations in hormones that happen, as well as so much of what we think of as our sexuality is in the brain. So what we know is that the experiences that young people have over and over and over again, the concept is use it or lose it. So there's tons of pruning and remodeling that's happening in the teen brain. So that makes us think, how should we be as parents? Is what makes me think. How should we be as parents? So there are different ways of thinking about parenting. I love this model that thinks about how do we nurture our kids? How do we discipline them by teaching them how to behave? So discipline is very different than punishment. Discipline is about setting and enforcing limits and monitoring behavior. Where are you going? I like to know where you're going. You know, just give me a call, whoever's there, just let me know what's up. This is your curfew. If you're not in on time, if you're going to be late, call me up, we'll discuss it. If you are out at 3 o'clock in the morning and you don't have a right home except from some drunk, call me no matter where or when. So you set the limits, but you also have the backbone to be flexible. So respect. Respect really is at the heart of the matter. Respect is about being treated 
in a way you'd want to treat yourself, be treated yourself. Oh, also, that'd be kind of nice. Be treated by the way you want to treat yourself, too. Oh, that's nice. That would involve more spa time, decidedly. <laughs> but think about this triangle, because they interact. So, nurture by being supportive, warm, and encouraging. So there's been a heck of a lot written on disciplinary techniques, tough love. I can tell you, tough love sucks doesn't work. 30 years as a child psychiatrist, tough love does not work. All it does is alienate and make kids feel worse and even more isolated. What we need to be thinking about is how can we deal with the challenges that they bring and still have a respectful relationship. So what it means is at the outset you have to have a very big respect for what they have to say and what they have to bring. Now, it doesn't mean lower your expectations. Kids need high expectations. I've had families, I've had kids who have told me, you know, I, my parents don't care about me. Why do you think they don't care about you? Because they have absolutely no limits. They have no expectations. If they cared for me, they would at least have some expectations and limits for me. So, we know from the research that teens have higher self-esteem when they are respectfully allowed to explore their environment. So what's the kind of parenting? Let's just think about this because many of you here are here as parents. So positive parenting, the ideal is positive parenting. The research on this is, is, is over, uh, over decades that shows that positive parenting so that is warm, you're high on nurturance, and you're high expectations, and you're high on respect. So it's warm, supportive, and encouraging while being firm, consistent, and clear with limits and boundaries. Now I have a real dilemma here because usually I tell stories about my family, but now that I've got family in the audience. <laughs> um, and so there are very, very marked ways that are different about how you can approach it. There are some parents who are dominating parents. These are the do it my way or the highway, because I said so, or else. So in terms of nurturance, so think about yourselves. In terms of nurturance, they're low on nurturance, but they've got really high rigid expectations. But the respect for the young person is very low. So I have seen many, many kids who people have asked me about conduct disorder. And you see that the kind of parenting that the kids have experienced is coercive, is cold. And what they say, I need to really clamp down now that he's a teen. If you give him an inch, he'll take a mile. And they are what, um, they, what Barbara Collar also calls the brick wall parent. So permissive parenting. Tons of this, tons of this. And I want you to keep in mind again, perking in the background, that how we interact with our teens as teachers, as parents, as grandparents, is building their biology. So if you're a permissive parent, uh, you're more inconsistent. You are, um, you've got high, high love, 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 love. Don't put the cat in the microwave, okay, honey, okay, honey. I love you, I love you, I love you. But they have low expectations. They're very, very inconsistent. Very, very inconsistent. And they only have moderate respect. So that's, I really want to enjoy parenting my team. It's important for them to fit in and have what they want and not have too many rules. We really get along better that way. So this is when I was up in Manitoulin Island. I heard about parents realizing that when the kids went out to parties, they were drinking. So why didn't they just bring the kids into them and buy the 22 for for them to drink at home? Wrong. Wrong. But it was what was happening in multiple places. So these were permissive parents who said, my relationship, my love, 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 love is more important than creating the respect and the high expectations. 
the unengaged parent who I have yet to meet in terms of not in terms of the behavior I see many many in my child welfare consultations I see many parents who uh, may be disengaged from parenting but when I talk to them they love their kids like crazy they don't have the skills to look out for and look after their children Unengaged parents are inconsistent presence in a child's lives. The teens essentially raise themselves. In those situations, it's low nurtures, low expectations, and low respect. It's time to let go now that my child's grown up. It's time to get my needs met. He can take care of himself. So again, back to the first quadrant there. Positive parenting makes a huge difference. So if we understand that positive parenting is about understanding the adolescent brain, that they are under construction, that their emotional brain, which I'm now going to talk about, is under, uh, under construction ahead of their stop planning and organizing, that they have a huge, massive drive to be social, they need to be social. We wouldn't be here as a species if the teenage boys and girls hadn't gotten bored. Right? Anybody heard, I'm bored. Right? So if they had just hung around the cave with mummy and daddy all those a, a millennia ago, then we wouldn't have had intermingling and uh, the creation of the species. So we are here tonight, aren't we lucky, because of our adolescent male and female ancestors. Is that not a reassuring thought? <laughs> and we will continue. So the social brain though is a huge, huge drive. Check this out. So this is a very famous goal, or lack thereof, lack of a goal, uh, by a famous guy called, uh, I think Mike Owen, Michael Owen, who was playing, I don't know, was he playing, I can never remember, um, maybe he was playing for Liverpool, and he missed a really important shot. So, did all of those people go to a class that said, when your favorite player misses a shot, go like this, right? Or is it mirror neurons? Is it in our brains, we are wired to connect up. We go like this because we see, we do others, we see others doing that, but as a species, we feel the other's pain. We now know that psychological pain lights up the same areas of the brain as physical pain does. So, you know, when your child goes on and on and on about not getting as many likes on Facebook, mm -hmm. or that their Instagram picture didn't get as many likes, we have to understand under construction and don't say, what are you talking about? But rather think, that in fact, that feels like rejection. I did a consultation just recently on a 10-year-old girl who had refused to go to school because they'd gone on a class trip, her friends got more likes on the Instagram pictures than she did. She was so embarrassed, she couldn't go to school. This is a whole other potent influencer on our kids. So, our children also, how we would remember that opening one where the guy is, um, is bungee jumping. He has been hyper-rational. He has said that the thrill of this is way, way, way more outweighing of the risk of it. So hyper-rationality. Anybody have an argument with a kid who smokes a lot of marijuana, who's read a lot? Talk about hyper-rational. There is nothing wrong with it. There's no negative effects for it. They have every answer in the book. It is so pro-weighted on, this is good. And that's what's happening. The power of the peer. Now here's a really important thing in my learning, is that the, th the drive to be with peers and attached to peers is hugely important. It's how, it's how we learn and how we grow. But it does not mean, as the commercials imply, that they are disconnected from us. 
that their attachment system becomes more robust and bushy, if you like, meeting with other peers and developing that. But I so remember, I so remember a disastrous um, family holiday where we went, we rented a houseboat up in Tamagami. And it was a disaster from the beginning to the end. We wrecked the canoe, we wrecked the, uh, the propeller, uh, the engine died, and we were stuck in a cove with no radio, no engine. We wrote SOS on the top with towels in case a plane would go by. And I, I actually still remember with my teenage daughter when she was at one point just sobbing, saying, I just want my friend. I just want my friend. And I physically can still remember how that hurt. That here we were with this magnificent, disastrous family vacation, and she was wanting something other than the misery that we were all experiencing together. But you know, exploring the teen brain, you get the point that it didn't matter. It didn't matter. Uh, in the end, it didn't matter in the end that she wanted to be with her peers, of course she did. The learning for me was it didn't mean that she loved me less. So, we see changes, absolutely. So are you noticing that the, your children are in the room more with the door closed? They have endless appetite for socializing with friends, but they won't go into the grocery store with you. They sit and they text instead. Peace can dissolve into conflict in an instant. Activity level can range from hyperactive almost to inert. So feeling that life just isn't the same rarely consults you and get very annoyed if you ask them questions. Well, this is called normal, typical adolescence. It is the frontal lobes under construction with the environmental drive being to be with the peers, to take risks, to get thrills. So the frontal lobes, when they are finally developed, are responsible for all of these things, governing emotion, judgment, planning, organizing. So my five kids ski race, which is kind of tough to do in Hamilton, you know, the, the big huge mountain that we've got, Hamilton Mountain, right? So we often would have to drive two and a half hours up north for a 29 second ski run. 29 seconds, and then turn around and drive back. So when my son was in, one of my sons who will remain nameless, was in his teen years, we drive up there and he's forgotten his ski helmet, right? So you, you can't come hurtling down that fast a hill without his helmet on. So I could have done logical consequence, except I never have. Um, and, and I had no, absolutely no confident confidence that if I said to my son, well, I guess, honey, if you don't get to ski today, then you'll remember from now on to bring your helmet, won't you? No confidence, zero, that that would happen. But what I understood was that his brain, his planning brain, was under construction. What he needed was me to be an external helper to develop that planning strategy. So what we said was, we don't pull out of the driveway without going over the list of what it is that you need there. So you need your helmet, your skis, all of these. It's amazing what we have not taken on ski holidays. <laughs> but, so we, but for racing, we had this list. And eventually my son said, you know, Mom, as we were put, we'd be pulling out the driveway or in the car and say, the list? So not, have you got everything? Remember the time you forgot to do it? No, the list. And um, he would eventually say, Mom, you don't need to worry about it. Everything's in there. As soon as I come off the ski hill, I drop everything into my bag. Now, it's a public health hazard. But it so you see, I am not packing his bag for him, right? I'm not packing his bag for him. I'm giving him a cue, and he develops his own cue 
to make sure that it gets in there. Now it brings up the other point about how do we most effectively communicate. So we have to have rules in our house. I know who's at home by the, the, the number of shoes at the door. Well now it's the number of cars in the driveway. But the number of shoes at the door. Now it takes a very long time to train up children, shall we say. So backpacks in the front hallway. Anybody have a little bit of a bugaboo about backpacks? So I am very, very good. I could go on and say, you know what? You leave your backpack in the hallway and Nana might come in and she could trip on it and she'd fall and she'd fracture her hip and then she'd get a urinary tract infection and she'd die. Right? Or I could say the backpack. So I've had to learn through my mantra of progress, not perfection, <coughs> progress, not perfection, that low emotion, few words. Low emotion and few words helps our kids develop their strategies. So let's look just for a second at one other component, and that is the fact that we, when we are overtired, when we haven't had enough sleep, tend to blab on too much. Well, guess what with kids? We now know that the adolescent brain, the melatonin, the, 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 the trigger for wanting to go to sleep in teenagers gets shifted. It gets changed to later. So they're not keeping themselves up. They're less tired. They're less tired until about 11 or 12 o'clock at night. But here's the kicker. They need more sleep than we do. So we have a chronic group of kids who are sleep deprived. My nieces, one of the things that they accomplished in high school, they say, is that they became able to sleep with their eyes shut. But what does it mean in terms of risk taking? If you're sleep deprived, if you've got a drive for risky behaviors, and you're out with your peers, what we see is that we're seeing more and more risk-taking behaviors that involve drugs, alcohol, fast cars. Now, I just have to say, none of these pictures are from home. <laughs> just so you know, so we're clear. So here's the challenge. How as parents, as we've got the greatest opportunity and the greatest vulnerability, what are some of the stories, what are some of the messages that we can give to our kids to support them? So let me just finish, and then we're going to open the floor for some, uh, for some questions. Let me just finish by talking about a really great resource that happens to have been developed by our Ministry of Education. I had a little bit of a hand in some of the, um, uh, some of the tools, but there is a fabulous tool called the Parent Toolkit Teen Edition. And what I like about it is it's gone and looked at the research and it is so easily accessible. If you Google it, uh, Ministry of Education, it was done by the, um, um, what does code stand for, Manny? Uh, the which? Council. C-O-D-E, the Council of Directors of Education. So it just reinforces what I'm telling you, which is probably why I like it a lot. So that is, <laughs> be a listener. It's so important that we stop jumping to management solutions for our children's behavior and start thinking that kids will do well if they can. Kids will do well if they can. So be a listener. First Nations people tell me that uh, a grandmother, my, uh, a, a colleague in Walpole Island said uh, that her grandmother always said, we have two ears and one mouth for a reason. We should be listening twice as much. And so as we're being a listener, Make the most out of the conversations you have. Point them to someone that you trust to be able to talk to if they're not comfortable talking with you. Talk about things that you both enjoy. Build the opportunity to have dialogue. 
my one son had a very difficult time in high school. He said that um, uh, Pink Floyd saved his life. And it probably did save his life, the band, because he was able to connect in grade nine with other students. But so me, I have a degree in music, I knew nothing about Pink Floyd now. I am such a freaking fan. They are such an amazing band. I knew nothing about Pink Floyd. So find out. What are your kids' passion? And find out more about them. Why? Not so that you can be cool like them or interfere with them as they're heading out the door, but so that you've got conversation, things to talk about. Be informed. Be a mentor. Be a coach. Be a learner along with your child. When we look at kids who are successful in school, Parents' involvement is huge. And it's not parents' involvement in, um, uh, in uh, volunteering in the school. It's what you create at home. That's the parents' involvement and engagement that matters the most. So ask them about their learning. In our EQAO results, the kids write things at the back of the, uh, once they're finished, and they ask them about, do you talk about school with people at home? Less than half of kids in grade three are asked about school when they get home. Wow. Part of what's happening in a program like Abacus, I'm sure, is that the parents are also becoming engaged and involved and interested in what it is that you're learning. Be a learner and be a guide. So let me just close then, uh, in these last 30 seconds, with, um, uh, with a story from my friend Mary Gordon. I want, to leave, I want to leave you guys with a real sense of hope and opportunity that change in relationships make a difference. So my friend Mary Gordon developed a program called Roots of Empathy. And in Roots of Empathy, I'm the Roots of Empathy champion in Hamilton. Um, uh, and we have got some great, great work happening. And um, it's when a baby and parents visit a classroom once a month for the school year. And the kids learn about synapses and, and neurons and nonverbal communication and temperament. And in this day, Mary was telling the Dalai Lama that in this classroom, this day, the, the, the teacher, the mom was talking about temperament. And she said, in the classroom, there was this boy who was 14. The other kids were 12 because life had been kind of unkind to him. He'd seen his mom murdered when he was four. He had lots of diagnoses, lots of foster homes. So he was a he was a really a really troubled young fellow. But Mum this day was talking about temperament, and she said, "You know, we wanted a really snuggly baby, but you get the baby the Creator sends, and He loves to look out on the world and kick his feet and interact with everybody. He's a baby Terry, probably lovely little extrovert, little extrovert. So." He loves to do this. So would anybody like to try using the snuggly? So did this boy, Daryl, come up and say, I'd like to try it? So the mum handed him the baby, and didn't that baby just snuggle right in? For the rest of the class, that's all that happened. The baby snuggled into this boy. At the end of the class, he brought the baby back to mum, and he turned to the Roots of Empathy facilitator and said, do you think somebody who's never been loved can learn to be a dad? So I want, I love that story. I know it's a hard story to hear. I love that story because of the hope, because of the changes in the brain and the changes that that boy saw possible of himself. I'm convinced <coughs> what I've heard about what the Abacus program is offering kids can create that same kind of hope and change. And I can then commend the Ham Community Foundation for and supporters for the amazing work of doing it. So I'm going to stop there and say thank you very much. Thank you.